truth, love, and the good. Here we go. Welcome to the DT PhD podcast. I'm David Tian, uh, one of your hosts. And for over the past 13 years now, I've been helping hundreds of thousands of people in over 87 countries attain success, happiness, and fulfillment in life and love. And I'm very pleased to be joined by my good friend, Henry Chong. Hello, my name is Henry Chong. I am the CEO of the Fusun Group. It's actually been a while since we've spoken, David, and since we have metamorphosed into a fintech company. And I spend most of my time on tech development. And I think that's something interesting for us to talk a bit about that later. Uh, but Fusang today is a fintech group building financial infrastructure for the digital asset economy. Very nice. And uh, Henry and I have been doing these podcasts together for over a year now. More than and that. And it's been a long hiatus. Yes. Yeah. Oh, you've read, that's right. More than, well, well, well more than a year. And uh, there's been a hiatus for... How long? Mm. Maybe six months yeah. at the high, at the long end. So um, I have not been doing a lot of public speaking lately. I've been doing a lot more writing. Mm. So I noticed I went on a live show today and I'm stumbling over my words and so on. And it's just because I'm out of practice in uh, long form public speaking. So hopefully this will go well. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting back in the rhythm of speaking. Uh, and what have you been up to, Henry? You've been quite busy. I've seen you in the news. Yes. Um... Well, as you say, also been heads down trying to build things the last few few weeks and few months. Um, as I said, today we're a fintech company servicing digital assets, including things you've probably heard about like cryptocurrencies. Uh, we act as a custodian to help store those things. And we're also uh, about to launch a digital asset exchange uh, in Q3 this year. So we've all been busy heads down trying to execute. And maybe that's a good uh, segue into what I think we want to talk about today, which is just beginning and just doing it. Yes. So we were uh, brainstorming on what topics. We had so many things we wanted to talk about. But one of them was something that's on top of mind for both of us. And it's about how do you get yourself to take action on things that maybe you've been procrastinating on or have just been like putting off or been afraid to do, but that you know you have decided and you know in your rational mind that you ought to be doing it. Yeah. So uh, we've got a bunch of tips and tricks and strategies and methods for you here uh, that we've uh, used quite a lot. And one of the things that I've been accused of is being too disciplined. <laughs> well, my friends say that, well, uh, it's easy for you to say, David, you're used to being disciplined in all this, um, but I don't see myself as very disciplined. And that one of the reasons is because when you set up the system correctly, like the system of your life, and you, you, um, and you get into these habits of action and thought, then there isn't much effort that's required. Because in my mind, discipline usually requires some kind of willpower. And there is willpower that is required to initiate the system of uh, where, where you're tricking your brain, so to speak. But then once you've got that set up and you're used to it, it should roll through, it should create the conditions of, your, uh, of, of uh, maximizing your effectiveness in your yes. life. So um, Henry, you, have, you had some examples why don't we start with some examples of people know what we're referring yeah. to? Um, you know, well, you know, a perennial favorite of people is talking about the gym, diets, for example. Uh, I just um, did one of my, uh, it was supposed to be monthly measurements, but again, I'd allowed it to stretch for a long time with my personal trainer and discovered that I'd gotten fatter than I used to be. And I guess for me, it's like, well, I know what to do. Uh, I'm going to need to go back on a low carb diet. But I'm, I'm also very, very confident that I can execute on that because, as Tony Robbins says, I've played this game before. Right? I know the path. I, I know exactly what to do. And I know that it won't be about willpower. I know that I won't have these internal monologues of how do I do it? What should I do? I just, again, you don't really think about it. You just sort of execute according to a plan. Um, and I think that's a really important point you brought up about people who have long-term stable and successful habits it's not about willpower you know you don't people don't really have to force themselves to brush their teeth in the morning and take a shower it's just you just kind of do it um and i think sometimes there's no other magic than that obviously you need to have a plan and you need to know what you're doing but that you know no one's going to lift those weights for you just like no one's going to help you brush your teeth you just got to do it and um, one thing that I've started doing recently is beginning to do cold showers again. And what I found works really well for me is rather than 
turn the shower all the way cold in the morning and standing there having a little talk with yourself about, I don't want to go in, it's going to be cold. It's kind of silly when you think about it anyway, because who are you talking to exactly <laughs> when you have these internal monologues? But instead, I just get into a sort of normal temperature shower and then I very quickly will just turn it a bit colder because a part of my brain will say, just do it. And by the time I get that negative feedback of, oh shit, it's cold, it's too late. And then I just kind of do it again quickly. And the minute I have that thought of, I should turn it colder, I don't think I just execute, so to speak. And I don't allow the internal monologue to, to take over and need to have a little discussion with myself. And I think that this is very applicable to all kinds of things, not just personally. We can talk about this a bit later, yeah, even in our business, as we're thinking about how to execute in some of these huge plans, like, look, we kind of all know what we need to do. You just got to begin, right? There's no other magic to it. Mm. Yeah, that's a, it's a great uh, reminder. And especially for people who are taking on big goals, that it's sort of like looking into the abyss, right? Or like if you're going to try to jump off the diving board and you start at the highest mm. diving board yeah. and you go very slowly across <laughs> it and then you get to the edge and you look down and you try to work up the courage to jump, it, it'll just you'll just freeze. Mm. And that's a natural human tendency. So um, one of the things that, well, example that you brought up of the, uh, the cold shower, mm. you're not, so as I understand your example, you're not just turning it cold and then, psyching yourself up to jump into this freezing exactly. cold shower, right? You're warming, you're tricking yourself into a nice warm shower and then you crank the yeah. thing, right? So there's a, sl it's a slightly easier way in to this bigger goal mm -hmm. or the scarier goal, I should say. And that's a really great way of thinking about it. So I like to trick my brain in a lot of things. So as you get better with controlling your thoughts, and one of the best ways is that I found is meditation. Mm -hmm. You'll notice that if you focus your mind and your thoughts on something that's scary, it gets scarier. Mm -hmm. Like whatever you focus on, you magnify in your mind. And there are many things in life that if you focus on them, they would make you nervous or they would give you anxiety. You might even get to the point where you're, you're frozen um, in terms of you can't think of anything or you can't do anything very easily. But that's because of your brain, like our human brains in the evolution of the world is a very unique thing. It's, very, it's probably the most interesting um, uh, re result of evolution, the size of the human brain. And one of the things that brains can do, we've evolved these gigantic brains, is that we can um, think ourselves into misery. We can also think ourselves into pleasure and happiness and joy. It's all in the brain. And if you focus on those things that will lead you to greater suffering or greater um, negativity, or if you, if you just dwell on the scary thing, it won't go away. In fact, it will magnify, all right? So what do you do? So you're not just gonna stare at the edge of the highest uh, diving board and stare down. That's not gonna help you and just try to work your courage. You know, um, Instead, you trick yourself. So there are, there are ways of tricking yourself into it in every scenario. Mm -hmm. And you just have to exercise a little bit of ingenuity to figure, what that, figure out what that is. So for the diving board, if it's just like your first time or it's been maybe a long time, and for me, it's been a very long time since I've dove, dove, in, dove mm -hmm. off a diving board, um, I would not want to do what I just described, <laughs> right? Like walk to the edge and stare down. I would want to like get up there, not, not look down. That's one of those things where you trick your brain. And you just, and again, like if you need to focus on something else, to avoid the negative thing that you're trying to, you know, the, the, so in other words, don't look where you don't want, like, don't look where that you're, where you're trying to avoid, like in the driving example. So I'll just keep looking up. Maybe I'll think about what we will eat for lunch the next day. I'll distract myself. Maybe I'll do sums or whatever. And I get up to the top of the diving board and now I will look out onto the horizon far away where I don't know, whatever. I'll look forward. I will not look down. And then I will relatively quickly get to the edge and yeah. move, right? So... I want to get, in the, get into the habit of moving quickly, because not because it's uh, beneficial in and of itself, but because this is a way of tricking my brain to um, short circuit the pathway to that thing that scares me. And because if you don't move quickly, I don't think you will do it at all in many cases, right? You'll psych yourself out of it. So it's not a question of just, oh, I'll take a 30 seconds to talk with myself and then I'll do it. It never works that way. Yes. And if anything, I yeah. think the struggle can be counterproductive. Right? So cold showers right. don't work and, and are certainly aren't fun if you're there trying to grit through it. The whole point is to breathe and relax into it. That's when you get the benefits. 
right? So I think mm. that's yeah, oh right, and 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 likewise in the gym, right? If you are tense and gritting your way through it, you actually have less power, um, right? Mm. You need to just right. yeah. yeah. So, so the gym could be another great example. Like I know people who are just starting out, and and maybe the the gym when they visited it had a lot of people who are quite intimidating or something, like grunting really loudly or looking at looking around and scolding, uh, scowling. So if you're a new gym person, you might think, oh, that place isn't for me. It's too aggro or whatever. But you know that you ought to go. And you're going to, you're, let's assume that you already figured out what your workout will be. And, and hopefully you've gotten good expert advice on this. Because I see, I see lots of people in the gym who have no clue what they're doing there. They just go from one machine to the next, like it's the circuit. Like the, they just do one exercise in each machine, something stupid like that. So hopefully you have a good workout. And now it's just about getting yourself in the habit of going. So it's not so much that it's scary. It may be just intimidating or something like that. So what you need to do is to ease your way in. And there are many ways of easing your way into the gym. One, uh, well, we'll talk about systems and habits to help you get there quicker. But one example would just be that you look forward to a reward at the end. So if you have a have a good workout, make sure you find a really good smoothie place and you look forward to a delicious smoothie at the end. Or maybe now you get to eat a more delicious protein rich meal as a result instead of the salad that you would otherwise have if you skipped the workout or something like that. You just give yourself a little reward that's healthy and in line with your overall goal. And you focus on that thought and you just got to get there. Another is, and this is my favorite, your chances of actually sticking with your workout regimen increase exponentially for every meter less that you have to travel to get <laughs> to the gym. So I figured this out, um, it was like 2007, I um, had the choice of living in a cheaper apartment further away from a gym or living in a condo that was like right above a subway station that had a gym on the second floor and a pool. And this is before, like, this is while I was a grad student. So it was a big decision to make. Can I spend my little grad student stipend on this? And I chose to do it because I met a, an executive um, who, a Canadian guy, who was living it up. He's like, my days are great. I swim in the morning. Then my office is in the same apartment complex. So he just walks in, indoors, like even in the dead of winter in Beijing, he just walks to the next tower, Tower B from Tower A. And his whole life is contained within these four towers if he chose to have it that way. Um, he could go down to do all of his grocery shopping in his flip-flops if he wanted in the middle of January. Um, and, and I thought, man, this is quite intriguing because I was slumming it in Beijing University on a bicycle in the middle of winter, which no one, <laughs> you shouldn't be doing that. So um, I was like, whoa, this is like a dream life. And I got the chance. And up until that point in my life, I was like almost 30 years old by then, I had been struggling to have effective workouts and an effective diet and sticking with a, a good workout program for like, uh, I started working, tried to work out like around 15 years old. So for 15 years almost. And then I finally instituted this rule that I will live as close as I can to this gym, which I hope to go to every day or, uh, for, or four or five times a week at least. And it, it was magic. How hard was it for me to grab my gym stuff Go down the elevator to the second floor. Now, if you don't live in the middle of a big city where that's easy to, like in many Asian cities, it's so dense that it's relatively easy to find a condo gym or a gym in your neighborhood that you could just walk a couple blocks. Right now in, in Taiwan, um, I look out my window and I see this gigantic five-story world gym that we go to across the parking lot. So it's not, that was one of the selling points for this condo. But if you live like many of you guys who are living in America, you have to drive to the gym. You, it's best if you make it as easy as possible. So you have a system where your gym bag, you leave it um, in, in, in your trunk. Uh, maybe just take your shoes in to air those out. Or, you know, so basically, the, or leave your gym bag right by the door and it's just... Maybe it looks ugly. Maybe you get a box to put it in so it doesn't look as ugly, but you have it there. You're not scrambling every day looking for all of the various things you need to bring. Um, or, you know, so you have your gym membership card in your wallet, wherever you go. Like things like this make it just a lot easier so it, you can ease your way into this habit that you're trying to institute for yourself. Um, so that's just an example of how you do it for the gym. You can do it for the diving board. You can do it for lots of other things. Um, so that's easing your way in and then also instituting these habits and routines that make it a lot easier so you don't yeah. have to think about it. You don't have to exercise willpower and, or decision-making. Yeah. And just create structure. Um, so, so, I mean, what I do for the gym is I have a trainer now. Um, I have given up trying to mm. motivate myself to get there. Uh, I have a trainer twice a week. I have never missed a session. 
right? Just because I understand myself and how I operate. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's worth talking a bit about why these things work, right? It's not, you know, when, when we say trick the brain, I don't want to trivialize it. I actually think that these are deep and fundamental psychological principles. Um, maybe, you know, not a subject for today. You know, we all have different components of our brain and different uh, entire different systems, your limbic system, for example, that doesn't necessarily want what your prefrontal cortex wants. Um, and the reason why I think it is so powerful to just do it, as we're saying, is that your brain will always be able to come up with excuses why you don't want to do something that's hard. We wouldn't be here talking about things that are not hard, right? So, you know, going to the gym is intrinsically difficult for most people. And that's why people need to talk themselves into it or psych themselves into it. Even though at some deep level, you kind of know that you want to go. And I think you can short circuit that whole self monologue by the minute you have that thought of, I should go to the gym, you just start walking, all right? You just get going uh, instead of you leaving it up for discussion, so to speak, and whatever it is in life, right? If you say, okay, well, six o'clock, I got to go to the gym. I'm usually in such a rush to get there. I don't even think about, do I want to be here? Do I not want to be here? And then by the time I'm there, I'm getting to warm up. And before you know it, I'm working out very, very hard. But at no point did I sort of sit down and think about, am I really ready to do squats today? <laughs> you know, And I, I think that this is true of, again, even very, very difficult tasks in life. So your diving board example, I think, is great because it's not just about things like diving off a board. A lot of endeavors that we want to undertake in life are big and complex and require a very long time to achieve. And more importantly, they require sustained effort over time. Right? That's that effect of compounding every single day. Um, you know, eating clean and being on a good diet, once you figure it out, it's not that difficult. But the point is you've got to sustain it over long periods of time. And if you allow your brain to contemplate the, the entirety of the effort required, it's just overwhelming. Versus if you focus, again, on what is right in front of you and just focus on actually executing step by step, it suddenly becomes a lot more manageable. Mm. Yeah, it's a great example. Uh, and I, I think of it as small chunking. Mm -hmm. So that's another way of easing your way in. So the diving board example, it could be just focus on, like if it really freaks you out, right? It would be just like um, progressive desensitization for people who have some kind of phobia. So you break it down into various la levels of difficulty. So, in the so, so take the example, actually a better example would be like maybe a mm -hmm. snake, right? So if you're deathly afraid of snakes, first you just look at them on a screen then you see them on a video, right? Then you progressively make your way to um, going to a zoo kind of experience where they're behind the glass. And then eventually you wanna work up to the point where you can touch a snake or you know have a snake around your neck without totally freaking out. And these are all little small chunk things instead of going from somebody has, is completely phobic towards snakes and then you just throw a snake around their neck. That's just not gonna happen, right? That you're gonna further traumatize this guy and it's gonna be even worse. So you have progressive desensitization. So the principle of progressive desensitization, you can also use that for to tackle any goal, especially ones that scare you. So small chunk it. Um, a book, for instance, is written best when you think about it. Well, you do have to plan it. Well, one thing is an outline. So you got to plan out the outline. Just focus on the outline. Okay, you got the outline Outline now. That's just, that's all. We're not going to commit you to writing a whole book. Just, just the outline. Oh, okay, we got the outline. All right, well, write the first chapter or one of the chapters that's easiest for you to write. Just write that one. And if it doesn't work out, you just put it out as an article. Okay, just write the one. And then you just focus on writing the one. Oh, well, now you have a chapter. Oh, well, focus on the next one. And then you just work your way through. And next thing you know, you have half a book. Yeah. Oh, isn't that interesting? But you didn't think, I'm writing a book. It's supposed to be 500 pages. And then you're just going to be frozen the whole time because it's too big. And this is actually the Karate Kid method as well. And I use this in my bigger courses, especially in Freedom U, which if you were to go through every hour or every minute of uh, the course uh, in the recordings, just the recordings alone, not even the live mm -hmm. components, you're going to be looking at over 50 hours, almost 60 hours, maybe more than 60 by now. And I do not recommend that anybody going through the course go through all 60 hours in eight weeks. It's going to be way too much overload. So what I recommend instead is the way that we teach it. And there are like different levels that you can go through it. So actually three courses in one, and it's the Karate Kid method. So if you hopefully know this reference, I'm old enough to have seen the first one with Daniel Miyagi. Probably you have heard of the one with uh, Jackie Chan and Jaden Smith. 
Jalen, yeah. Jaden, Jaden Smith. So, well, so the idea is uh, this thing, karate. He's got to learn it in like a very short amount of time. I don't know, six weeks. And he has to fight this other kid who's been learning karate, studying karate for years and or Kung Fu in the Jackie Chan case. So the way around it is by breaking down the movements into manageable bite sized chunks of, of re repetitive action that he can already do. Mm -hmm. And then it's just a matter of once he masters those repetitive movements that he can already do, then just linking them together. So he, you don't say, hey, look, you're going to master Kung Fu in six weeks. And it's just this big thing. Like, how am I going to fight this guy? He's been doing it for years. No, it's this small chunking. And we'll focus on these discrete units. You get good at that. Then you get good at the other discrete unit. And eventually, we'll just link them up. It's also the same way you play piano. So I studied piano, uh, Jesus, for over like 10, almost 10 years. Really sad that I can't play very well now. But the way that we learned it is in the standard way is that you learn one hand at a time. So you don't just get thrown into, okay, here's Mozart, play both hands at the same time, because the brain generally is not that coordinated with just reading the music and then going this. So you just do one hand and you do one section, maybe five bars or whatever makes sense for the music. And then you master that on the left hand. Then you master that same set on the right hand. Then you put them together, right? And so depending on the piece, depending on the teacher, you might just do right one hand each through the whole piece and then come back, put the whole thing together. Or you might break it down into discrete sections, eight bar sections, and you break it left, right, and then you put them together, then the next one left, right, put it together, or whatever it is. But no matter what, no one's gonna, no good teacher is gonna just throw a student in there and say, here, play it. <laughs> and you just like fumble your way through, like unless the kid's a genius or something, in which case, you know, he could just probably learn it by ear. Um, so small chunking it. And thinking about almost anything you want to do in life, getting a job, small chunking it. And let's move back to actually just draw the application to guys who are struggling with dating because I have a sizable audience from that niche. Everything we're saying applies to that. So, I mean, the easing your way into it, that sounds really sexual, but we don't mean it that way. <laughs> easing your way into it when you see a beautiful woman that you want to meet. And with women, it's less of an issue. Uh, there's less anxiety associated with just meeting the hot guy. But with dudes, there's a lot of anxiety because of evolutionary stuff that uh, you'll make a fool of yourself. There are repercussions from our evolutionary brains hundreds of thousands of years ago when bad things could happen if you approach the wrong woman the wrong way. So we just understand that that's natural. So you can just forgive yourself for having those anxieties and then take action. And one of the actions is small chunk it. So the first thing is just get your feet moving. Mm -hmm. Just focus on moving that way. You don't have to talk to her yet. Just move over there. And then put your hand out and just, you know, just or just get her attention. It's probably better than just tapping her. Get her attention. Get her eye contact. Make sure that she sees you in a peripheral vision. All right. Okay. So you got that. And then actually just that, just getting, moving into her presence. So you're next to her or near her and getting into her peripheral vision is a big win for a lot of guys who have approach anxiety. And in fact, if you're smooth, that's all you really need to do. So now you're there in, in peripheral vision and you can just look over and give her a look if you know how to flirt with your eyes or smile if you know how to do that. Or you can now suss out the situation, right? And if it calls for it, you can get her attention, maybe tap her on the elbow or whatever. And now you're in. Now you haven't even thought about what you're going to say yet. That's okay. In fact, one of, some of the best ways to go is just throw yourself in the situation and then improvise. Yeah. And it's the most natural. She'll feel it. She'll feel like, oh, wow, this guy is courageous. He's confident. And this is genuine and sincere. It's not some hackneyed line that he says to every girl. And she feels it because it's actually real. And this is an example of how if you're afraid to approach a woman and you're overthinking it, you're planning out what you're going to say, then the next thing, the next thing, how you're going to ask her on a date, all the stuff, you're overthinking the first, you, you have a whole 20 minute script, let's say, and it's in your mind and you're like running the script before you even walk up to her. Guys like that, they will never take action. They just watch girls go by and they will do nothing. Frozen. So that's an ex easy example of easing your way in. Just focus on the next yeah. step. Just focus on the next step, right? And then the way to figure out what, what's the next step? Well, just small chunk it backwards from the goal. Right, then just calculate it back and then just focus on the next yeah. step. You know, every, you know, I write this newsletter and people seem to quite enjoy reading it. And I can tell you every <laughs> single month when I sit down to write it, and it's often hours before I, I always send it out, you know, first Sunday of every month. And some things never change. I always leave things to the absolute last minute. But <laughs> I've made a public commitment to send it out at that time, but I've never missed a deadline. 
And every single time I find it intimidating, you see me staring at that blank page and I'm like, what on earth am I going to write about? How am I going to get this done in time, etc." And I do what Hemingway said, you know, he said, you just sit down and you write one true sentence. You write the truest thing you know, and you go from there, right? And that's it. That's exactly what I do. I type something and then you just, you know, you keep typing. And before you know it, uh, you know, a few hours later, you've got this thing and it always actually perpetually amazes me how that process even works and how it can just come out. And, you know, this, what you were saying reminds me of um, you and I have gone to a lot of Tommy Robbins conferences together. We're about to go up to one in a couple of weeks. And he has this thing oh, when yes. he, he, you know, he'll ask someone a question and they'll say, I don't know. And you'll say, okay, well, I know you don't know, but if you did know, what would you say? And without fail, every single time someone has something, right? And I think that's just, that's just a great point and a great life lesson that in almost every case, you kind of know what you should be doing. You just come up with reasons and this internal monologue and excuses. And it's like, you know, at some point you just got to do it. Like in the gym, like walking up to meet someone, you know, those weights aren't going to lift yourself. No amount of staring at that squat bar is going to help. At some point, you just got to make the decision to lift it. And that will never change. It will never get easier. You just have to take action every single time. But I guess you can learn to the habits around that. You can learn to not stand in front of the squat rack chatting to yourself and you can say, all right, you just, you just go. Hmm. Yes. So there, I've done a man up episode recently. If you haven't seen man up, go and check it out. And there's a recent uh, episode on overcoming the fear of failure and in my therapy training. So a lot of the therapy training I've done for was for myself. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I, I was doing it for myself and then whatever I learned, I can pass on to others. But I came uh, first and foremost in my ther doing therapy for myself and then going to all of these various trainings. And then I started to realize that there are a lot of people who are not like me. And one of the ways that they're not like me in my, my cohort, I guess, my peer group, is that there are a lot of people who are not achievers. In fact, that's the majority of the world by definition. And the majority of the world by de like, who are not achievers still have the fear of failure, but they're from different roots. So achievers have the fear of failure because of things like perfectionism, being worried that they won't do it well, that they're not going to succeed. There's too much pressure on them. And then the, the majority of the world has a fear of failure because they don't, because of the opposite reason, they have no pressure because they haven't done well at anything yet. And it's just uh, reminds them whenever they get started and they feel this challenge that, oh, this is what it was like when I was in grade four and I fucked up that and I got an F and the teacher uh, scolded me in front of the whole class or um, whatever it was, just a, a record of failure. And they've just given up. So in therapy, actually, when the average person comes with a fear of failure, you are supposed to lead them through, basically be their life coach. And this is where life coaches excel over therapists. A life coach would help you figure out, well, what have you actually succeeded for, succeeded in in the past? So you can be at least grateful for those and appreciative of those and to magnify those. So, oh, I have been able to um, at least move out of my parents' house or whatever, or get a job or graduate or something like that. Even if I didn't graduate uh, with good grades, I graduated. So I finished, right? And reinforcing yourself from the past. But then assuming you don't have that much in the past to be proud of, now it's a matter of finding what you can do. And that's the small chunking thing. Okay, can you at least get up out of bed? You know, can you at least wake up every day at eight? Can you just do that? All right, great. And can you do that for five days? Cool, you've done that. And let that sink in. And you just start small, like giving these small wins. And eventually you have big wins. You just add up into this track record of competence and so on. But for achievers, we have this track record of competence. And yet... We still have this debilitating fear of failure that, and maybe I jumped the gun because part of the reason why I think people um, have trouble taking action is, beca is because they're afraid that that first attempt is going to suck. So it'd be better, actually, this is pretty deep psychology. It'd be better for achievers not to even try because then they can say, well, I didn't even try. Of course I didn't win the medal. I didn't even try. It's like when you're racing somebody and you don't put your full effort in it, you can always get to hold back and like, I could have beat you if I tried, you know, that kind of thing. So achievers do that kind of thing all the time, even though they don't even want to admit it. It's like unconscious. They don't put their best effort in there because if they did, then that would prove to them that they're not as good as they front or that they're not as good as they hope they are. And this is something that I had to learn. I had to learn to drop the facade of like, because what happens is when you get past wins, 
other people expect you to win now with this new thing. <laughs> they, keep, they expect you to keep winning. And you expect yourself to keep winning and you're afraid that you won't. So then it gets harder and harder over time. This is why you often don't see child prodigies do well. You know, they have this amazing set of expectations, like they do amazingly well, and then they have these expectations foisted on them that they can't live up to, and so they just cave, right? Or they can't deal with the pressure. And unless they get some good therapists, they're not going to be able to sustain that. Instead, uh, and lots and lots of uh, research has been done on this uh, to prove this, that people, include, especially children, do better by getting reinforcement, not on results, but on effort, right? Like you did your best. That's the most important thing versus, hey, you won. <laughs> Congratulations. That's why I love you, son, because you won, right? That's not going to actually help him in the long run. It's going to really hurt him. And one of the things that I had to learn to do well at this in life, at starting new things and uh, beating challenges, is to be comfortable. In fact, not just comfortable, but um, become more, uh, uh, take joy in, take pleasure in um, failure or uh, imperfection, uh, especially when it's at the beginning, when you're just learning, because you're going to make a lot of mistakes when you're just learning. You're going to need to do those practice sets, get those out of the way, get your warm up sets out of the way, um, especially when you're learning, when you're a white belt. You're, gonna, you're supposed to be messing everything up. Otherwise, you should just skip to black belt exam. <laughs> and what this does for hopefully now as a, an achiever, you can say to yourself, awesome. Because this is where my growth lies. This is one area that I could, if I choose to, I can find happiness and joy in because happiness comes from growth. It comes from progress. And if you're just an achiever and you're protecting your heritage or your legacy, I should say, you're protecting your past wins, you're actually not happy. Guaranteed. Right? You're just actually insecure about everything and you're just like hoping no one finds out. And that's imposter syndrome. <laughs> um, and instead, if you just embrace the fact that you will fail and even take pride in it because it means you're growing and you can, and it also means when you show off your early failures um, or if you're a white belt beginner at anything and all your screw ups, that actually is very attractive because the subconscious message or the subcommunicated message is that you're incredibly confident with yourself, which means to people who are, I mean, like the upper 50% of people who are savvy with this, emotionally intelligent, it, it communicates to them that you have past wins, that you're, you're an achiever. Yeah, of course. He knows he, if he persists with it, he will do well in it. And uh, for all the men out there trying to become more attractive to women, it's very attractive to women. This self-deprecating humor, for instance, and just showing them your fumbles when you're learning something new. So if you're learning dance for the first time, get a video of all the fumbles you make. If you're um, learning BJJ, you get somebody to videotape you doing your best, trying your best, but getting like tapped out or whatever. It's great because it shows that you're human, you're vulnerable, and you're comfortable, and which also then demonstrates that you're confident. You're comfortable with the failures, knowing that there will have to be these learning sets, these practice and warm up uh, sets. And I'll give you, I'll just end this long uh, monologue here <laughs> with uh, one example. Recently, uh, relatively recently, it feels recent to me, but it's been months already. I've been on a habit of writing every day. And when I first, so in the past, for years and years, I have chunked, or what's it, batched my writing, um, often not from choice. <laughs> so, you know, the end of the school term, Suddenly you do all the papers and it's so sad because you were assigned these papers at the beginning of the term, but most students don't get started on them until the couple of weeks before they're due or like in my case or in many of my friends' cases, like not until like the week before or whatever. And you go all the way to the last minute. Maybe you're good at getting extensions. Or I don't know. So last minute, right? So I was used to that. And that's how I wrote my dissertation. Some 300 something pages. I wrote it, the bulk of it, like I wrote 80, maybe 90% of it in a month, month and a half uh, of every night till 2 a.m. Uh, and I was in my office doing that. The air conditioning in Singapore at National University of Singapore cut out at, at a certain time, like 9 p.m. or something. So I'm in the heat, just writing away, just getting it done because I got an extension. I'm very good at this. <laughs> after getting three master's degrees and a PhD, you learn how to hack school. I got an extension after I got my job. I still had uh, one semester to get the final thing in. Got it in, done. But then I realized when I wanted to get into a habit of writing more than just like blog posts, but like actual, uh, like bigger pieces, that um, 
that I would need to have some kind of discipline around it. And I tried to batch it. It works for some people. Apparently, it works for Tim Ferriss. Like, I'll take one day a week, and that's all I do. Unfortunately, I'm also managing a business. So there isn't, I can't just shut down for a whole day and only do one thing and not get on Slack and, and manage stuff. So I, I, I kept struggling with it until I, I decided it'll be like working out. So I, it's just like the human body you can't just work out all on just one day. It's very difficult to get gains that way. Though some people are arguing with me on that, but I think it's much easier for you if you, instead of doing, I don't know, like two hours twice a week to instead split that two hours up into half hour chunks and do it uh, six days a week instead, like a little 20 minutes, six days a week, you get better gains. I think it'll be, and it will, more importantly, it'll be easier to follow through on that habit because it's every day. You don't have to think about it. Just, oh yeah, this is just part of your daily routine, like brushing your teeth. Make it like brushing your teeth. So for me, it was, I had to small chunk it so much to make this manageable. I started off with the length of a tweet. I commit to writing tweet length uh, essays, right, every day. And then eventually I was able to expand that, expand that. And then the tricky thing was I travel a lot. I've been trying to cut down on that because of the productivity. But unfortunately, I travel quite a bit. Um, it's like a, a week, a month now. And that's, that's pretty low for me. But that just that one week where during that week I'm doing therapy training, I'm getting trained in therapy or whatever, and I can't keep up with the writing because it's like nine to six or whatever for the th training, and then I have to I have all these other meetings. And I, so I stop doing it for a week. Then I come back, oh my God, it is so hard to get started again. It's just like that first day, you kind of just like get acclimated again to the office, and then the second day you get your gym routine back, you get the diet, and get, okay. And then you gotta like, okay, I have to get back on the writing. And then you, the, one of the bad things was I thought I would have to try to make up for it. So I would try to make up for, for all the times I miss. Oh, horrible. And I realized it's like P90X for me. Wherever you stop, just start up again. Don't try to like make up for it. Like there's some people who are very perfectionist and I have a lot of students like that who are achievers and they miss a week and they, to punish themselves as a kind of self-punishment schema, they redo the previous week. And now they're two weeks behind. <laughs> So don't punish yourself. Just keep going forward. Just forgive yourself for the slip up and move forward. And um, it just taught me the power of habit. When I'm rolling in this habit, it is super powerful. I don't have to think about it. It's an autopilot. But once I break the habit, starting it up again is uh, it takes like three times more energy, four times more energy. And um, I have to contend, content myself with those first essays sucking. <laughs> Or like I sit down and restarting. It's, it's like the workouts when you first start up again after taking uh, weeks off or whatever. It's going to be painful and you're going to suck. And you're going to have to, you'd be like, I'm so weak and I have no cardio. Yeah, that's right. But you got to do it anyway. And you just, you just have to. And one of the things is if you content yourself with it, you expect it. This is a necessary part of getting back up there, of getting back on that habit. Then it's a good thing. Then you can just embrace the suck. <laughs> yes, this means that I'm getting back as progress, right? I'm getting back on it. So uh, being co becoming comfortable with uh, the uncomfortable, becoming comfortable with failing, uh, becoming comfortable with practice uh, or warm-up sets or getting back into the routine and sucking at the beginning are all crucial parts of getting out of that perfectionism loop and just getting it done. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of, uh, my laptop is actually running out of battery <laughs> faster than I expected. Oh. But I wanted to say that I absolutely agree with, with what you're saying. And, you know, especially in today's world where things are moving so quickly, I actually think that rather than sitting around trying to plan everything up front uh, when it comes to more complex projects, certainly in business, it's actually often quicker and more efficient to, I mean, you come to a fork in the road and you're not sure whether to go left or go right, you just go left. And then you'll very quickly figure out if that's the wrong way and then you can go right. And you'll still be quicker than the guy who's standing there trying to plan at the fork in the road. Um, you know, the Chinese have this mm -hmm. saying where they talk about crossing the river by feeding the stones. And they say, look, uh, especially when you're trying to undertake big complex tasks that you have never done before, that maybe no one has ever done before, like some of our projects, you just kind of got to start and you will begin and you'll take it step by step and you will small chunk, as you say, and you figure it out as you go along. And in those cases, mm -hmm. it's impossible almost to plan. You know, um, plenty of famous generals have said about there's no point, to try, you know, or, you still need to plan, but you need to expect that your battle plan will not survive contact with the enemy. 
And so you need to be adaptable and resilient and you just begin and you take things step by step and you adjust as you go along. And, 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 and another thing I've been trying to do more myself recently is just what I call right, riding easy in the saddle. As you say, you miss a week, oh well, you get back on it, right? There's, there's no secret to that either. You fall off the path, well, at some point you just get back on. There's nothing else that you can really say. Mm. Yeah. How much uh, battery do you have left on that laptop? Uh, like yours? 4%. So. <laughs> oh, damn. It's that okay. Nice so, laptop. well, yeah. Um, well, we can wrap up here. Uh, there was a, a couple other points we wanted talk, to make. Talk for the next and, time. Uh, Part two. Yeah. We will make those in the next podcast. Um, let's just r- recap what we've covered here. Um, I call it a trick in the brain, yes. but there's probably a, a more... Um, weighty way of thinking about it uh, or putting it. Um, another one is easing your way in to these scarier yeah. goals or these bigger habits that you want to adapt uh, into your life. And then creating habits yes. and routines and a system and a structure. Um, and then the, the point about small chunking it, um, breaking it down into manageable bite-sized uh, smaller goals that if you just focus on those, it'll make everything easier and it will exactly. add up. And then finally, being comfortable with um, failing or not, or, or just sucking, <laughs> embracing the suck at the beginning. Exactly, and I think I think so even f- saying com- comfortable failure is almost the wrong word because that has a negative connotation. Mm-hmm. To say, look, anytime you undertake some big, audacious, complex plan, uh, you're not going to get it right the first time. So it's almost silly to call it failing. It's like, well, of course, it's not going to ma- work magically. You've got to try a bunch of different things. Um, start trying. You know, don't sit around talking and waiting for the perfect moment because it will never come. You already have all yeah. the information you need in many cases. You already know what you need to do. Just begin, right? Just start. Don't yeah. wait. Life is far too short. Yeah. Yes. And, and there's also scientific evidence for the satisficer over the maximizer. So those who just get it done uh, will generally be happier with the outcome and will uh, be able to be more effective than those who try to maximize every decision and they hold off on it until they have the maximum uh, amount of information. Uh, they're less happy with the outcome, whatever decision they do end up making, and the decision is only marginally optimal in most cases, and sometimes it's even worse. Yep. So get in the habit of being decisive, yep. and um, it is going to make you more effective and happier. Yep. So what else could you exactly. ask for? Speaking of decisive, uh, we should wrap this up before my laptop dies. <laughs> we lose our recording. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. All right. Welcome back to the DTPHG podcast. We have done our first one of this year, and we'll be doing many more to come. Um, Henry, how do they get a hold of you? Uh, you can find me on my personal website at henrychong.com. And I'm sure David will link to that in the show notes somewhere. Uh, I, as I was mentioned, I, start, I write a monthly newsletter, which people seem to enjoy, even though I write it always last minute. So maybe our techniques that we're talking <laughs> about work. You can sign up for that on my website as well. Excellent. And you can learn about me at davidtnphd.com. You can see all the show notes at the link below, uh, wherever you're finding this uh, podcast. Um, And thanks so much for following. Uh, We will see you next time. David Tian and Henry Chong out. Okay, so the last episode cut off early because Henry's laptop was running out of battery. And instead of doing an entire separate episode to end off the last couple points we wanted to make, I figured I would just tack on this addendum and get it done this way. So um, just adding on the last couple points, they were pretty important. So I didn't want to just forget them. I wanted to make these points um, because it's all part of the same thing. And uh, it would make most sense to to mention these here. So um, in addition to what we had discussed already about tricking the brain, or that was my term, um, coming up with systems, habits, and structures um, to trick the brain, to get um, to ease your way into Uh, the thing that you're trying to accomplish. And then the the second point we made was becoming comfortable with messing up and practice sets and warm-up sets, and then small chunking it, like Karate Kid style. So in addition to those three points, I also wanted to mention um, the idea of juggling a lot of plates. So one of the tricks that I discovered that achievers do a lot, and it's great for achieving goals that maybe scare you, is if you just have this one goal or if you only have maybe one or two things on your plate, then that one thing may get um, you may get shoved under the rug and procrastinated on. But if you if you say yes to a lot of things, if you almost overcommit, then you probably won't get all of the things that you've committed to complete. 
but you'll get a good portion of them. So if you're used to, uh, in your mind, um, because of the pressure from uh, perfectionism or overachievement or whatever that is, that those unrelenting standards, you might end up only accomplishing 60 to 70% of what you set out to accomplish. So what you should do is to set out to accomplish more so that at the end of the period, at the end of the day, you'll have accomplished more than if you had um, aimed lower. So I'll give you an example. Uh, in high school, I went to a performing arts high school. And one of the things that we were forced to do when we first started there in the ninth grade was to keep a practice log. And we had to hand in a practice log, I think it was every week or every month, to our head music teacher. And each week or whatever the interval was, it had to get signed off by a parent. So the idea was that you logged your practice time at home and your parent or guardian would just sign their initials next to each column or whatever it was. And somewhere around the 11th or 12th grade, our head music teacher brought that up again. We're going to do practice logs. And everyone's like, uh. And we, so we did them for a few months or a couple months. And she was surprised at what we found. And I was equally surprised. So what she found was those of us students who were the busiest, that is, we had the most extracurricular commitments, we had the heaviest course load, we had um, taken on the most advanced musical pieces and so forth, were the ones who were actually putting in the most practice time. At that time, when they were doing that practice log, I think I was averaging around 90 minutes private practice a day, in addition to all of the other um, band and choir and all of that stuff after school and before school. And the average practice time in our class, and the, again, this is a performing arts high school, so everyone in the class was a music, music major. The average uh, practice time was 30 minutes. So um, I was also one of those people who had said yes to a lot of other committees and um, organizing yearbook and all those other things and um, Christian fellowships and all kinds of other stuff and an extra heavy course load. So the teacher was surprised. If you wanted to get something done, she said, give it to the busiest person which is ironic. I'd learned that lesson in high school, but it, it paid out. Like I just see it, I see it everywhere in life. The busiest people get the most things done, um, not just because they're busy, but because part of, partly because of the fact that they've committed to so much. There are, gonna be, there are always going to be things that um, fall under the radar or that slip or slide, whatever it is, right? that fall, into, fall between the cracks. So knowing that, you should say yes to a lot more things so that you'll get a lot more done, even though maybe you're still working at 80% capacity. Now that 80% that you do get done is a lot more than somebody who said, who, who said no to a lot of things and we're still working at 80% capacity. So anybody who's tried to write a, a book and has maybe blocked out like a month or whatever it is to write that book and that's all that they're going to do has already probably experienced this problem where you still are only going to get 80% or whatever you're, you know, you're, you're, you, whatever you're used to getting that, let's say it's 80%, which is already pretty good, um, getting 80% of the result from that one thing, right? So um, if you had just said yes to a lot more things, you will probably, so a great example of this is Elon Musk. <laughs> um, and actually there's so many examples to pull from this Jeff Bezos. And, um, and I, I read these biographies all the time about these successful people. And one of the patterns that I've discovered and what I've discovered in myself and all of my friends who have um, be become very successful, much more than I, in fact, ha has been the fact that they said yes to a lot of commitments. And of course, they, the more you do well, the more commitments come into you, the more offers and opportunities. So you're going to end up having to say no to a lot. So if, if you start saying yes to a lot and you do, maybe you're still operating at 70, 80%, but now you've increased your net, right? So you're, you're saying yes to 10 things instead of three. And, but now you're getting 70 to 80% of those 10 things done. That means that you're doing, you know, versus 70 to 80% of three things. Now you're, you're doing six or seven things more than you would have otherwise. Because your standard is still there. Your standard is, is still going to be applied to the things you've said yes to. But now you've done all this, uh, now you've accomplished all these other things that you wouldn't have otherwise accomplished, accomplished by taking on more responsibilities. Well, guess what's going to happen? The world, your boss, the, your company, whatever, is going to give you more opportunities. And now you're going to have to really prioritize no, saying no, 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 but still realizing that you're operating at max efficiency. And one of the things that you can do is if there's some big goal that you're trying to accomplish, um, take on an even bigger goal and not do that.
So, so it's, it's this uh, way of that successful people trick the brain, right? So one is, um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I don't know, we're going to land on Mars or we're going to create a colony on Mars. That's pretty far-fetched. That's a gigantic, hairy, audacious goal, right? A big, hairy, audacious goal, as Colin says. And maybe he won't get that, but he will get to the point where he's going to create this rocket and get closer, closer to that. Then if his goal was just, we're going to make it to the moon or we're just going to leave Earth's orbit or whatever it is, um, or get, into the, uh, get in, out of the atmosphere, um, or get some commercial uh, space travel or whatever it is. Um, now the goal is bigger. So he may not accomplish that goal, the biggest goal, but he'll accomplish the number two or three goal. He'll have a better chance of accomplishing, accomplishing the number two or three goal as a result of setting his standards higher, of aiming higher, of also saying yes to more things um, that are uh, perhaps even more stressful um, because of that. Now, in the back of your mind, you know that uh, you probably won't get that big goal, but you're going to strive for it. And then to get that big goal, you're going to, of course, you got to do this other thing. And this other thing that would have otherwise been this gigantic goal for you with all of this weight now becomes, ah, I just got to get this thing done because, you know, this is, this is one of the lower goals now. And you'll notice that people do this naturally when they do well in fitness. So we go back to the fitness example because it's a, one of the most relatable ones. Um, the idea that if you say, I'm going to, I don't know, like do an Ironman, um, and that maybe you haven't even done a marathon yet, right? Uh, that's going to be pretty crazy, right? Because you've got now, you've got more than triple the workload and preparation. But if you actually aim for the Ironman and that's in your mind, like, then you'll be like, okay, well, I got to do the, the running. That's like just no duh. That's just one of those things. And then I got to do the, the swimming, no duh. And you just break that down, right? Versus if you had lowered your sights, and then you procrastinated on the marathon. Now you can procrastinate on the Ironman, all right? And then do the marathon to, in procrastination to the Ironman, just put off the Ironman. But if you had aimed for the Ironman, uh, sorry, aim for the marathon, you could procrastinate the marathon, and now you're just doing a 5K. You see how like, and obviously you want to small chunk everything, but you notice that if, uh, there's, so there are two sub principles here. One is to aim higher, aim bigger, um, aim more uh, ambitious or audacious than the goal that you are currently struggling with, right? So you're aiming higher, um, aiming beyond. And another is saying yes to more. And among those more responsibilities that you take on are things that maybe are more, that, that have more higher priority. And what will happen is you're going to feel worse about getting those, um, about putting those things off. And this thing that you've got that you could just get out of the way and just get it done because you've been, actually, it's not as much of a priority, you would get that done. So we tend to procrastinate on those things that are the most uh, pressure and stress filled, um, whether that's the final exam paper or the thesis, those big things, we procrastinate on those. But if we know we have a dissertation, just gigantic thesis at the end of three years, well, we'll get this, you know, this term paper of 20 pages out the door. Because um, that's just, that's nothing compared to the 300 page, 500 page tome we have to produce at the end. But we're saying yes to a bunch of these things. And that's what, along the way, I also discover this in almost every area of life, but one of them is grad school. If you say yes to a lot of conferences, that forces you to write conference papers <laughs> to, because you got to show up now and you, you bought your ticket and all of that. And now you got to fly out to the, the conference and you're supposed to present and you, all you gave them was like one paragraph abstract and a title. And now you got to present the paper. So you got to write it. And now it, it's a matter of, okay, I got to write this thing. And you can actually cobble together a bunch of these conference papers and you'll have a, a good chunk of your dissertation, for instance. But if you just, if you had just said, oh, it's this one conference this year, I'm only going to do this one. Then if that one conference becomes this big thing that you'll put off, perhaps, or maybe just write in with some excuse or something. But now that you have all these other responsibilities, this isn't such a big deal. And you just get that done. And over committing in that sense is something that I've discovered as uh, a common uh, pattern among very successful people and achievers. So I just wanted to point that out as the final point. Oh, and then, and then Henry tacked on, so his sub point on this one, on overcommitting, we'll call it that, is that um, once you are super busy, you become a lot more direct with people. And that might mean that um, one, of the, one of the great things about just doing it, just getting things done, is that if you're so busy, you'll just say to people, 
um, you just cut to the chase, right? You'll just cut out that small talk that doesn't get you anywhere and all that. And this applies to dating as much as it applies to um, networking and your professional, you know, like at, at work and so on. And even with your, your family and so on, because you're busy, you just cut to the chase. There's no, you know, like game playing and all this. Just like, this is what I'm about or whatever it is, whatever the context is. And this is what I need, or this is what's going to happen or whatever, or this is what I'm looking for. And you just cut to the chase because you're so busy. Overcommitting does that. Whereas those who don't overcommit, who undercommit, who uh, they'll f- who just focus on one or two things, those one or two things become magnified um, so that they become these big, um, heavy, pressure-filled things. And those are easier to put off. It's easier to watch Netflix than to go to those uh, because those now are just gigantic. You've just magnified the weight of them. But if you just say yes to a lot of them, then you'll discover, oh, I can actually get this done. I just got to get this done because there's another thing waiting for me that I have to do. (laughs) And the people who are busy often are the ones who get things done. (laughs) Um, So become busier, counterintuitive, hack there. Um, And it will also make you a lot more direct with people, which is not just efficient and effective, but it's also incredibly attractive because it's sub-communicating that you got a lot going on. And that you got a purpose and a passion for whatever it is you're doing and you're driven. And these are all great traits from an evolutionary perspective. So it makes sense that they'd be attractive, especially um, women, uh, female to male attraction, that women will find this attractive in men. Okay, so to wrap this up, another recap. We've done a couple recaps already, but another one. uh, Tricking the brain through easing your way into this big goal. Uh, One way to do that is through instituting systems, habits, routines, and structure that will ensure that you uh, make your way in towards that goal. Second is being comfortable with messing up and embracing the fact that there will be practice and warm-up sets along the way. So just get those out of the way as soon as you can. And then the third point was small chunking it. I gave the example of Karate Kid and just breaking things down into bite-sized manageable pieces and then doing, and then just prioritizing those and then just doing them one at a time and get, getting through the whole thing, um, breaking it down so it's not so um, uh, scary. And then finally, the one I've just added here as the addendum, um, overcommitting, the idea of taking on a lot more responsibilities uh, because you're, you're actually going to um, continue to operate at your usual efficiency, even if you have a lot more responsibility, and that will actually help you downplay Um, the stress that's associated with the procrastination on those bigger or those other goals that used to be big. But now you've got even more ambitious, um, audacious goals. And this then has the beautiful side effect of being more direct with people in your interactions with them and cutting to the chase, getting to the point, um, which is actually going to be attractive as well as effective and efficient. Okay, so wrapping things up, thanks so much for listening. And uh, we're going to be trying to, and again, I'm going to just say yes to a lot more stuff, be trying to uh, put out uh, this podcast uh, once a week. So I appreciate your support. Um, Let us know what you think of it. Join the private Facebook group. You'll find the link for that um, in the show notes. Check out the show notes, by the way, which are on uh, the David Tan PhD site. Um, So I'll be giving you all the instructions for that um, right after this at the end. All right. Thanks so much for listening. David Tian signing out. Hey, it's David again. Before you go, a couple last things. First, all the show notes and links to resources can be found at davidtnphd.com backslash dtphd podcast. Or you can just go to davidtnphd.com and find it through the top navigation menu. Second, if you'd like to interact with me and other like-minded fans of this podcast personally, then join our private DTPHD podcast Facebook group. We've got an awesome community of intelligent, wise individuals from literally all around the world. You can send a join request to the group using the link you'll find in the show notes of every podcast at davidtnphd.com backslash DTPHD podcast. Click the link, log into your Facebook, and then click to join. We approve join requests every day. So go to davidtnphd.com and click the link to join. See you inside our group.